Hello everyone. Welcome to this ENT session of the recall question of FMG January 2024. Now I am your ENT faculty and surprisingly there are a lot of ENT questions this time. 20 questions around there, 20 questions. 20 questions in one paper, ENT questions are a lot of questions. But fortunately, most of them the questions were easy, simple questions, they were not tough questions and they were all from the notes and the e Google app. So those who have attended the lectures or was the e Google app, you must have had a field's day that yesterday, at, at least as far as ENT is concerned. So let us straightway start with the recall of ENT January 2022 FMG. First question, very simple question. A child of tonsillectomy eats a packet of chips two days after the surgery and now came to hospital with oral bleed. As a medical officer, what would you do? So clearly this is a complication of uh, tonsillectomy and this is the most common complication of tonsillectomy, hemorrhage or bleeding and this is what has happened and we all know that tonsillectomy bleeding can be divided into three types, primary bleeding which happens during the surgery, reactionary bleeding which happens within the first 24 hours that is first day and any bleeding after 24 hours is secondary bleeding. So since this bleeding is two days after the surgery or anything two days, four days, five days, two weeks, it is a secondary bleeding. So this is a case of secondary bleeding. Now what is the treat, uh, what is the co most common cause of secondary bleeding? The most common cause of secondary bleeding, although we say infection, if you read your books, we all say most common cause of secondary bleeding is infection, which is true, but a slough forms in the tonsillar fossa. When you remove the tonsil, in that area, a uh, healing takes place and the granulation tissue forms over the healing process happens and that is called slough. And that protects the tonsillar fossa from any trauma when you eat food and all that. But if you eat anything sharp like chips or anything, it might mildly touch this tonsillar fossa, that slough and it might start bleeding, which is a combination of bleeding, uh, uh, infection and trauma. And we all know that if it is reaction, if it is secondary bleeding, then we don't do, it's by and large a conservative management because secondary bleeding is always mild, secondary bleeding is always mild bleeding that means it is not severe bleed and that is why and it usually stops on its own, usually it will stop after few hours on its own and that is why we do not have to bother too much. Therefore, we say antibiotics is only treatment, conservative management is done. In reactionary bleeding, reactionary bleeding which happens in the first 24 hours of surgery, that is severe and massive bleed and it is sudden bleed, there we have to take the patient to the operation theatre and do a re -ligation. But this is secondary bleeding, therefore you will not shift the patient to the ICU, <coughs> you will not shift the patient to the OT4 tonsillectomy. Only antibiotics can be a correct answer. But if there is a choice, one choice is only antibiotics, one choice is antibiotics with semi-solid fluid, food and then this becomes your better answer because the reason for this bleed was flu, uh, food which was not uh, semi-solid, a uh, chips is, cannot be classified as a semi-solid food and that created the problem. So we have to advise the child and the parent of the child that the child should take a uh, semi-solid fluid for food for a few more days and give antibiotics if there is an inflammation that will subside and the bleeding will stop. So that is the correct answer A, antibiotics and semi-solid food. Now before I proceed further, there is a disclaimer here. We all know that these questions have been produced by you guys. You recall the question, whatever you say and accordingly we frame the questions. Also the images, the same image can never come. So you give us an idea that this kind of image was there, this kind of image and based on, on our experience, we try to guess that what is the correct image must be. So trying to say that the question and the choices may not be absolutely the same that was asked in the exam and the images may not be absolutely the same in the what was asked in the exam. 
but we try to recreate the nearest possible question and choices and images. So, there may be some problem here and there or mistake here and there. So, please let us know if there is any correction to be made in future videos we can make the corrections. Okay. So, right. So, I hope that this question and this answer was correct for most of you antibiotics and semicellular fluid and I am pretty sure the choices were not exactly the same, but you get an idea. Question number 2. Another simple question very straightforward. This is a question about laryngomalacia which is of the following is correct. Laryngomalacia is a very popular topic of larynx. The first topic of larynx is laryngomalacia. We all discuss this in all our uh, papers, in all our classes and the choices are is the most common cause of strider in newborns. Supine position relieves the strider. Surgical management is required has inspiratory strider. Right. Now, uh, what did you write? What was your choice? Can you please let me know what was your answer? What did you mark? So, there are two correct answers here in this particular uh, A is correct answer that it is the most common cause of strider in newborn children that is true and it has inspiratory strider is also true. So, obviously, there is some mistake in the choices that I got. I talked to the students and they said these are the choices, this is what they could remember. Maybe instead of inspiratory strider, there was expiratory strider written. In that case, only A becomes the correct answer. Okay. And obviously, supination does not relieve the strider, supination makes it worse. Pronation relieves the strider in laryngomalacia and conservative management is done we use the word reassurance which is like a conservative management surgery is often very very rarely required in this patient okay so uh, a is the a and d are the correct answer if instead of inspiratory expiratory was written that straightway a is the correct answer now let's assume let's assume for a moment hold there it's a very important point that i'm going to tell you both were given the choices a is also in the choice and 4 is also in the choices and you have to pick, pick one answer. Sometimes it happens that there are two correct answers and you have to pick the better of the two. So, in this case, if A was also given and the last one is also given, it is the most common cause of strider in newborns and has inspiratory strider both way in the choices, then which is the better answer? What do you think is a better answer out of the two? Then we must say that the better answer is uh, 4. This is a better answer. You know why? Because although laryngomalacia is the most common cause of strider in newborns, but the strider in laryngomalacia does not start immediately after the birth of the child. The strider usually starts 3 to 4 months after when the child becomes active, you know, when the child starts moving the limbs and becomes very active, then the strider usually starts, not when the child is born. In neonates, infants, neonates actually does not start. So, that is why I said that out of the two, uh, D is the correct answer, but you should know basically we are discussing this is just whatever was the choice depending on whatever the choice is, one of the two is a correct answer. Either if it is the most common cause of strider in newborns, infants that is the correct answer and it has an inspiratory strider. And this finding is called omega shaped epiglottis, we all know this. Usually this is the most popular question from laryngomalacia. What is the finding described as omega shaped epiglottis? Okay, next question. Another very simple straightforward question. A biology teacher after taking long rigorous 8 hour classes since 6 years began to have hoarseness in his voice and the image is shown which of the following condition is associated with this? Is it vocal cord nodule, vocal cord polyp, Reinke's edema, vocal cord carcinoma? So, what is your answer? What did you mark, guys? See, this history where the, there is a teacher who has a rigorous kind of a schedule, the patient teacher has to teach a lot and the patient begins to have hoarseness, both can be true. Vocal cord nodule could be the disease and vocal cord polyp, both can happen in a teacher or a singer who has a voice change. Rinky's edema, does not happen in singers. Rinky's edema 
happens in a talkative and smoker females usually only and vocal cord carcinoma happens due to smoking and alcohol in elderly person and nothing is mentioned it is not about a female who is talkative and smoker and it is not an elderly person who, smoke, who is a chronic smoker so these two are straight away out in from the history i am talking about the history i have not seen the image yet now when you have to pick between the nodule and the polyp then the image comes into play and this image if it was the similar image you can see their growth on both the vocal cords and they are very tiny growths they are whitish in color and this goes in support of vocal cord nodule okay now between nodule and polyp the image is going to decide because nodule vocal cord nodule main thing is it's bilateral this was a bilateral growth it's small growth relatively and uh, it is whitish in color whereas polyp is unilateral vocal cord polyp is often unilateral it is larger than nodule and it is reddish in color but this is small and whitish in color not red and rinky's edema has edema on the both the vocal cord and they look like balloon filled with water you know this is how we describe water balloon or balloon with water and carcinoma of the vocal cord is a proliferative growth so this is i'm talking about the uh, the the image history i told you already the history is going to be different and the look of the nodule polyp rinky's edema and the carcinoma are very different from each other that's why in the classes i show you all the important growths in one frame if you if you if you have attended my lecture in one frame so that you can differentiate between different growths very easily because history sometimes can be confusing because all of them have hoarseness of voice and maybe disney also so it becomes difficult sometimes to pick up the correct di uh, the correct disease on the basis of history so image becomes very important in vocal cord nodule i tell you this the images of tympanic membrane in ear and all the growths of the vocal cord are very very important images they keep getting asked very often and they can be very very diagnostic of the disease in case of uh, all these conditions so you should be very very mindful of that next question another this was a slightly controversial question uh, controversial in the sense the choices based on the choices that i got after periodontectomy surgery most common nerve damage see after periodontectomy surgery straight away the most common nerve damage is facial nerve yes or no without doubt everybody knows that but i am told that facial nerve was not even in the choices two were confirmed there was auricular temporal nerve in the choice and marginal mandibular nerve and these two were controversial some people said this were the choices some were saying other things but greater auricular less auricular let's assume these were the choices now then becomes the answer that now when we say facial nerve is the most commonly nerve that is damaged in uh, parotidectomy surgery that is true but the whole the main trunk of the uh, facial nerve is not damage we all know look at the diagram also shown that in the parotid gland facial nerve divides into five branches and they divide supply different part of the face muscles of the face isn't it there is a temporal branch zygomatic branch buccal branch marginal mandibular cervical there are so many branches now does the do all the branches get damaged in parotidectomy usually or does the main trunk of the facial nerve gets damaged so that all the branches will get damaged the answer is no usually few branches of the facial nerve get damaged during parotidectomy surgery not all these five branches not the entire nerve so if facial nerve is not given that means they are looking for which is the most common branch of the facial nerve that is damaged most common branch and the most common branch of the facial nerve that get damaged during parotidectomy surgery is marginal mandibular nerve so in this case if facial nerve was given in the choices that is a correct answer if facial nerve was not given in the choices then the correct answer is marginal mandibular nerve marginal mandibular nerve supplies the uh, lip area usually the lower lip because the lower lip is related to the mandible that's why it's a mandibular nerve and the most common finding when the facial nerve is traumatized in a parotidectomy is 
that the lower lip on the side of the surgery does not move properly. It is different from the other side. Rest of the face is normal. The eyes will close. The forehead crease are there. The nasal level fold is there. Mouth is not deviated, but the lip, lower lip cannot move properly. And that is the most common facial nerve palsy finding in a parotidectomy surgery. And this part, the lower lip angle area is supplied by the marginal mandibular nerve. So that is the correct answer, my dear friends, if facial nerve is not given the choices. Not auricular temporal nerve, not greater uh, auricular, not less occipital, no other nerve. Okay? Done. So I hope this is very, very clear. Marginal mandibular nerve. Next one. Now, some people said, uh, the question was different. They said parotidectomy surgery, superficial lobe is removed and which are the superficial lobe is involved in a parotid uh, disease. So, which of the following surgery will be done? Uh, there is wide excision, then superficial parotidectomy and two other choices I could not get. I don't know whether this question was asked or not. But the answer, if this was a question also, then the answer is between these two choices which I know already. Uh, if, even if I don't know the next, uh, rest of the two choices. If superficial low of the parotid gland is involved by any growth, then superficial parotidectomy should be done. In parotid, we almost never do excision with the wide margin or wide excision is never, never done. Okay. Uh, so, superficial parotidectomy is, is the correct answer. And when there is a parotid swelling of the superficial lobe that requires surgery, 90% of the time it is pleomorphic adenoma. We all know pleomorphic adenoma is the most common tumor of the parotid gland. It is a benign tumor of the parotid gland pleomorphic adenoma and it usually involves the superficial lobe of the parotid. So, the whole superficial lobe has to be removed and this is a surgery where facial nerve becomes critical especially the marginal mandibular nerve that we have already discussed. Right? Uh, wide excision in the parotid is almost never done for a growth in the parotid gland for any growth. So, if this question was asked then superficial parotid means straight away the correct answer no matter what other other choices. So, maybe both the questions was asked, maybe one of the two were asked, but you know the answer to both of them by now. So, I can see uh, this was the question. Yes, the second question was the exact question. So, some of you are saying that second question was the exact question and in that case, uh, superficial parotidectomy was the correct answer. And somebody is saying uh, that Ali is saying that radiotherapy is one of the options. Maybe there was chemotherapy or maybe total parotidectomy was the answer choice. Now, total parotidectomy and radiotherapy are done for malignant tumors. And malignant tumors will not only involve the superficial lobe, it is a very aggressive tumor. Uh, malignant tumor of the parotid gland is very rare. The most common malignant tumor is uh, mucoepidermoid carcinoma. It is a very rare tumor. I will say that 9 out of 10 times if there is a tumor in the parotid, it is a pleomorphic adenoma of the superficial lobe and we have to do superficial parotidectomy surgery. So, I hope that is settled now. No radiotherapy, no chemotherapy, no radical, uh, uh, total parotidectomy, all these are not done for these things. Okay, guys. So, let us go to the next one. Uh, another simple question. Patient with history of sinus of the ear seen in the picture. So, this is a pre-auricular sinus. So, as you can see, this is a pre-auricular sinus. It is a very common pathology in a practice when we practice ENT. We keep getting these patients almost on a regular basis. And the question is, uh, this: what is this anomaly due to? Is it a congenital anomaly? A child is born with this. So, what is the cause of this was the question. Is it due to failure of fusion of first and second brinkle arch? Is it due to failure of fusion of first and second brinkle pouch? Is it due to failure of fusion of third and fourth brinkle arch? Is it due to failure of fusion of second and third brinkle arch? I think most of you must have got it right. We all know that the external ear, pinna and the surrounding area is formed by first and second brinkle arch. First and second brinkle arch is responsible for the formation of the external ear mainly. Pouch is responsible for the formation of middle ear and the tonsil. Pouch forms middle ear, station tube, tonsil, all these areas are formed by the pouch. So, this question is not about the middle ear and the, and the station tube. No. So, pouch is out of question. 
fourth third and fourth arch and second and third arch they form they uh, they are responsible for the rest of the neck you know mandible and the below higher bone and larynx and all that they come into play so the correct answer in a preauricular sinus is first and second branchial arch straight away i think most of you must have got it there is no doubt about this okay then we go into next question uh, now this question may have been a bit of tricky question but and you must have if you have read if you have searched the correct answer in various books and all i am pretty sure you do not get the correct answer to this question that which of the following bone you will remove in decryosystorhinostomy surgery endo dcr endoscopic dcr it's called a surgery done for decryosystor and decryo cystitis which is the inflammation of the lacrimal sac so it is maxillary plus ethmoidal bone is it maxillary plus lacrimal bone is it maxillary plus ethmoidal plus lacrimal bone is it ethmoidal plus lacrimal bone so guys i want to know what did you write in the question which one did you select so i want to know what what did you answer so that i can give you the correct answer now really uh it's not a very easy question for you right okay somebody saying there was a choice called uh, maxilla plus lacrimal plus nasal bone again ali is telling us that this was also one of the choices okay now there was no choice saying only lacrimal bone this was not in the choices as per my information right if only lacrimal bone was given in the choices then this becomes the best answer okay but since this was not given in the choices we have to go for all the three bones maxillary ethmoidal and lacrimal now see la this is a surgery through the we pass the endoscope in the nose and we have to make a opening in the lacrimal sac in the middle meatus there is a very pop pop popular question that in this surgery decryosystor anostomy where do you make a opening or bypass the answer is middle meatus so we create a opening in the middle meatus but between the lacrimal sac and the nose there are bone bony wall so you have to remove the bony wall from the nose only then you can access the lacrimal sac right so the most common bone that has to be removed always always without which you cannot access the lacrimal sac from the nose is the lacrimal bone but lacrimal bone forms if this is the lacrimal sac and this is the lacrimal duct nld as we call it so the lacrimal bone most of the posterior part is covered by the lacrimal bone so this is the very thin bone this bone can be removed very easily and most of the time when you remove this lacrimal bone you can do the surgery easily right that's why i said this is the best answer if alone but some of the anterior part of this lacrimal bone lacrimal sac is covered by maxilla a uh, frontal process of the maxilla this is covered by frontal process of maxilla so sometimes we have to remove this frontal bone of the maxilla also to gain a complete access to this sac so in most people we only have to remove lacrimal bone in lot of people we have to remove the lacrimal as well as the frontal process of the maxilla so lacrimal and maxilla becomes a correct answer sometimes in lot of patients actually in front of this there is a agar nasi bone agar nasi is obscuring a part of this area and so unless you remove this agar nasal bone again you can't access the uh, entire sac properly and this is only present if the agar nasi is big a small agar nasi may not create a problem if it is big and so you may have to remove this also and agar nasi is a part of ethmoidal bone so you may have to remove agar nasi also 
So, all the three becomes the correct answer. That's why I said most of the people we only have to remove lacrimal bone. If that is given, that becomes the correct answer. But if they are giving you lacrimal plus maxilla, lacrimal plus maxilla plus ethmoid, lacrimal plus ethmoid, then you have to go for all of three because they are saying, in, in other words, they are asking which are the bones you may have to remove depending on what kind of the anatomy the patient has. So, we may have to remove all the three bones and that is why this is the correct answer, lacrimal plus maxilla plus ethmoidal bone. Okay? Yes, only lacrimal was not in the choices, that is why lacrimal plus maxilla plus ethmoid is a correct answer. Okay, Ali? Now, let me show you the image. Now, this is a skull and this green bone that you see is the lacrimal bone. This is a lacrimal bone okay? and this bone is the frontal process of the maxilla. This is the frontal process of the maxilla and inside there is a agarnesia in the same area and lacrimal sac is here or let me use a different color lacrimal sac is here outside but you are approaching from inside from the nose so mainly you have to remove that green bone most of the time it is sufficient many a times you have to remove the red one that I have created the nasal bone uh, maxillary bone frontal process and the agar nasa which is a part of the ethmoidal bone so that is the correct answer now look at this another image now this is showing the bones of the lateral wall of the nose from inside from inside you can see the lateral wall of the nose now this is your inferior turbinate inferior turbinate I am sure you know is a separate bone this is a middle turbinate very popular bone and this is a superior turbinate these are the three turbinate bones this middle and superior turbinate they are both part of the ethmoidal bone inferior turbinate is a separate bone middle and superior turbinate are separate bones now this is your frontal sinus so this is your frontal bone this area is a frontal bone and this is the frontal process of the maxilla maxilla is going towards the frontal process so frontal process of the maxilla and this is sphenoid it has nothing to do with this particular question now can you see this illuminated area this red area which you see which is seen here this illuminated area is the lacrimal sac so what they have done in this cadaver they pass a probe from the lacrimal lacrimal uh, gland lacrimal uh, punctum they passed a probe and they have inserted that probe into the lacrimal sac and illuminated it and taken a picture from the nose. So, they show you the location of the lacrimal sac. Now, if I have to do this surgery on the lacrimal sac, this is your lacrimal bone. I have to remove this lacrimal bone and a part of this uh, maxillary bone and if there is an agarnesia here, I have to use the agarnesia which is a part of the ethmoidal bone. Okay? So, these are the bones that I will have to remove during this surgery of dacrocystoid anostomy. This is another image showing you the same thing, the bone. Now, this is from the outside. This is we are seeing, uh, the previous image was from inside. Now, this is from outside. Now, this cavity that you see is the cavity for the lacrimal sac. The lacrimal sac is located inside. Okay, And this is your lacrimal bone. See, this much of the sac is covered by the lacrimal bone and this bone is the frontal process of the nasal bone. So, this much of the lacrimal sac is covered by the frontal process of the nasal bone. So, in most of the patient, you have to remove only the lacrimal bone. In lot of patient, you have to remove both these bones so that you can get excess. And if you see from inside, in this area on the inner side, there may be agarnesi which may have to be removed which is a part of the ethmoidal bone. That is why all the three is a correct answer. I hope you get a lot of uh, concept about this surgery. And in future, if they ask you anything regarding this, it should be more in PG. When you do PG and all that, then it will be more easy for you. But we'll go on to the next question. Uh, very straightforward question. Most people that I've talked to have got this right. A lady with nasal obstruction and foul smell have crust in the nose. Likely diagnosis. It's very straightforward. Is it atrophic rhinitis, allergic rhinitis, rhinitis sicca, nasal polyp? Uh, maybe the choices may have like some people said rhinit rhinitis medicamentosa was one of the choices. I am not too sure. But even if rhinitis medicamentosa was given in the choices, if there is a lady with block of the nose, foul smell from the nose and crust in the nose, these three combination 
straight away points was atrophic rhinitis. In atrophic rhinitis, we say that uh, there are five or six features besides uh, these nasal block, foul smell crust, there is roomy cavity which is not given. Last to last year, they are asked about roomy cavity. Same similar question. Then there is uh, anosmia, loss of sense of smell and it may bleed not necessarily. So out of this feature of atrophic rhinitis, three are given in this question. And atrophic rhinitis incidentally seen more commonly in females also. So in the question, the, late, uh, the patient is a female. So everything is pointing towards atrophic rhinitis. And the image also, this is a typical image of atrophic rhinitis. You can see a crust, a greenish black crust in the nose. Some people say merciful anosmia was mentioned in the name. If merciful anosmia is mentioned, then there is no doubt left Everybody knows that merciful anosmia is a feature of atrophic rhinitis. There is no mention of allergy. However, even otherwise in allergy, there is no foul smell and there is no crusting in the allergy. Allergy has itching and sneezing and watery and all that things happen in allergy. Now, rhinitis sicca can have a very similar thing, but rhinitis sicca, there's two things. Sicca means dryness. There's dryness in the nose only in the nostril area. The anterior end, the end of the nose has no dryness. Inside there is nothing. So there is no crust inside, nothing. And usually rhinitis sicca is seen in professionals, people who work near fire, who work near, you know, uh, in like industries where there is a fire, heat, lot of heat. Those who have to stand there for long hours, dryness happens and that causes rhinitis sicca. And there is no mention of such a thing. And in such atmosphere, females don't work, male work. So rhinitis sicca is seen mainly in males because in this very hard situation, usually they employ males. Females they don't employ. So as it is, that doesn't happen in females. And nasal polyp is a very, it's a growth, pale growth without any bleeding. It's a very different kind of uh, disease. So I hope this was not a problem for you. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Which, are the, which type of strider is present? in croup. So no strider, biphasic strider, inspiratory strider or expiratory strider. So croup is also called laryngotracheobronchitis. And we all know when the larynx and trachea and bronchus, all the three are involved, you will have biphasic strider. If it is only supraglottic growth, supraglottic, then we have inspiratory strider, like we had a question on uh, uh, epiglottitis, which is uh, laryngomalacia, which is a supraglottic place. If it is subglottic growth only, then you have expiratory strider. And if it is glottic, then it is biphasic. And this growth, which involves glottis also, subglottis also, will have biphasic strider. So straightforward, there was nothing difficult here. Next question, a diabetic person with ear pain and HbA1c of 10, that means the patient is chronic diabetic, a long-term diabetic, presented with excreting pain in, in the ear and blood stain discharge. Diagnosis is diffuse otitis externa, necrotizing otitis externa, serious otitis media, and granular myelangitis. The last choice I did not get, I produced this myself, but I, I don't know what was the last choice. But, but first three people say that th this, these are correct choices. Now this is very straightforward. A diabetic with chronic diabetic with ear pain and blood stain starts is very likely to be a patient of malignant otitis externa. And malignant otitis externa is a necrotizing disease of the nose, and that's why you can be called necrotizing otitis externa also. So that's why we'll go with necrotizing otitis externa. Diffuse otitis externa usually does not have severe pain and there is no blood stain discharge. And diffuse otitis externa is not necessarily seen in diabetic. Diffuse otitis externa is seen in people who get exposed to dirty water. You know, people who go into the swimming pool and the, they go to the, they swim in the sea or swimming pool or get drenched in the rain or uh, to the ocean, sea, beach and all that. And the dirty water goes inside, then the, the ear gets infected and they have some kind of hearing loss, discharge, mild pain and all that. No, it is not, it is not related to diabetes. It is not related, there is no excruciating pain, there is no severe pain in this patient. And serious otitis media is a middle ear disease. Again, serious otitis media is seen in children. It has nothing to do with diabetes. Again, serious otitis media is an inflammation of the middle ear. 
non-infected inflammation and there is no discharge. In serious otitis media, discharge is never, if there is a discharge from the ear, serious otitis media cannot be the diagnosis. Simple. And granular myringitis is an infection of the tympanic membrane, is a tympanic membrane infection and it does not have this kind of a problem. There is a swelling on the tympanic membrane in that problem. So, it is a very dizzy, very simple topic, a very simple, very easy to rule out rest of the things in such a patient. So, straight away it is necrotizing otitis external, correct answer. Okay. Next one, uh, this is my favorite question. I have been telling you this question so many times in the classes, in the lectures that uh, you see a audiometer and what do you see in audiometer? That uh, this is a 25 mark and AC is below 25 mark. So, this tells you it is conductive hearing loss. BC, this is BC, there is a Cahart's notch. Cahart's notch. And so, if a audiogram shows conductive hearing loss with Cahart's notch, we all know Cahart's notch is a feature of autosclerosis. Autosclerosis. In serious otitis media, you will only see, serious otitis media, you will only see conductive hearing loss, no notch. In Meniere's disease, we have a question on Meniere's also, incidentally. In Meniere's, there is upward sloping audiogram in AC plus in BC and pressed by acusis, again it is downward sloping graph. In pressed by acusis, it is downward sloping graph like this. So, pressed by acusis, senile deafness, hearing loss due to old age. I think everybody got this right because uh, this is a very popular uh, finding of audiogram, autosclerosis. Right. Now, this is the, another question where there is a, the history tells you a 50 year old male presented with vertigo, fluctuating tinnitus and hearing loss. So, if you hear the word fluctuating tinnitus and fluctuating hearing loss with vertigo, straight away we know it is Meniere's disease. Even if they do not give you the image, you know it is a finding of Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease typically is described like this and the audiogram shows both AC and BC in the right ear, AC plus BC are below 25 mark, 25 is somewhere here. So, this tells you it is sensory neural hearing loss and this is upward sloping or rising audiogram as we sometimes call it and rising is seen in Meniere's disease. So, everything, there is so many hints here telling you fluctuating hearing loss tinnitus, upward sloping audiogram, sensory neural hearing loss, all these are pointing towards uh, rising audiogram, okay, uh, Meniere's disease. Now, BPPV has only vertigo, there is no hearing loss in BPPV. So, is vestibular neuronitis again only vertigo are the symptom. So, these two diseases BPPV and vestibular neuronitis, vertigo is the only complaint there is no hearing loss, they straight away out if there is hearing loss and acoustic neuroma can cause hearing loss, but acoustic neuroma A, there is no fluctuating hearing loss and B, in acoustic neuroma usually we get a downward sloping audiogram either downward sloping or deep at 4000. In acoustic neuroma, either downward sloping or deep at 4000 can be seen, certainly not upward sloping. So, straight away, it is a, a simple question, uh, Meniere's disease. Next one, a patient with, with a roadside accident with severe maxillofacial trauma with respiratory distress, best way to secure airway, tracheostomy, oropharyngeal airway, nasopharyngeal airway, cricothyroidotomy, intubation, I have given you five choices because there was a confusion, some there was a confusion with intubation was given or not, so I added so that we can discuss it. Now, what did you mark guys? What is your answer? A lot of people say that they have been told that cricothyroidotomy is a correct answer, which is not the correct answer, 100 percent sure it is not the correct answer. Okay. Now, if you, you have a maxillofacial trauma, if your face is mishappen damage, you can't put a tube from the oral cavity, you can't put the tube from the nasopharynx, you can't intubate from the mouth. All this is not possible in the maxillofacial, in maxillofacial, severe trauma of the maxillofacial, these three are straightway ruled out, straightway. So, we are left with two choices, either tracheostomy or cricothyroidotomy. Now, which is the correct answer? See, cricothyroidotomy is a very, very rare procedure. It is done in a very serious acute infection, only done when tracheostomy is not possible. The setup is there, tracheostomy is not possible. If tracheostomy is possible, we will never do cricothyroidotomy. Why? I will tell you. So, tracheostomy is the only correct answer, 100 percent. There is no doubt about this, tracheostomy. See, I have been practicing ENT for 25 years. 
I must have done tracheostomy more than 500 tracheostomies in my life. But I have not done even one cricothyroidotomy in my life. Not even single cricothyroid. It's only theory for me. I have not done it in 25 years. It is that rare, my dear friends. Why? Why? Now, the why answer comes from here. I'll tell you why. See, there are two very popular questions you must have read. What is the shape of cricoid cartilage? It's a very common question. Why this question is so much? And the answer is ring shaped. Signet ring as we call it. That has implication. And the second question, which is the preferred site, site of tracheostomy? Ring 2 and ring 3 are the preferred site of tracheostomy, we all know. Okay. Now, look at this image that I have shown here. Now, this is your cricoid cartilage. Okay. And ring 2 and ring 3 are these two rings. This is the site of tracheostomy normally. Now, why is tracheostomy not done in ring 1? Why ring 2 and ring? Why not ring? What is the problem with ring 1? Because ring 1 is very close to the cricoid cartilage. Any procedure that we do in the larynx, any procedure, we want to stay away from this cricoid cartilage. Because cricoid cartilage has a complete ring shaped cartilage and if the cricoid cartilage gets inflamed, traumatized, then it can because it's a ring shape, it gets blocked very easily and the cricoid cartilage gets blocked, then dys, uh, dyspnea will happen and dyspnea can be problematic, life-threatening also. So, we cannot allow cricoid cartilage to get inflamed or more traumatized. That's why we always remain away from cricoid cartilage and that's why tracheostomy is preferred in ring 2 and ring 3. But if I do a cricothyroidotomy, which is a hole in the cricothyroid membrane here, See, you are so close to the cricoid cartilage. If you do a cricothyroidotomy, your cricoid cartilage is always get inflamed and, and blockade and dyspnea will all, the problem will always, if you do a cricothyroidotomy, the patient is always going to have a problem in future, always. And that's why we don't do it. And mind you, cricothyroid problems are very difficult to treat. Crico uh, cricoid cartilage problems are very, very difficult to treat. You can't treat them easily. There's very difficult. Cricothyroid problem is very, it's a headache for the surgeon. So, we always stay away from here. That's why cricothyroidotomy is only done A, when the patient is about to die. You feel that patient is already gone. To revive the dead person, almost dead person, then you take chance. And B, if tracheostomy is not possible in that case also. If tracheostomy is possible because all the ENT surgeons are trained to do tracheostomy in 2 minutes. Even if you get 2 minutes, you can do tracheostomy provided there is a facility for tracheostomy. You must have all the instruments and the tracheostomy tube. But if that is absent, then and only then you do cricothyroidotomy. So, cricothyroidotomy in this case is not the correct answer. Tracheostomy is the correct answer always if it is given in the choices. Okay, done? You know the reason why. Okay, next question, simple question. A patient presented with findings in the external auditory canal. Uh, following trauma on so there was a trauma in the patient and they, on examination there was a clot filled in the canal so when there is a clot in the canal due to trauma always is bound to happen uh, what is the next line of management again i have given you five choices i don't know which is which are the four correct choices aspirate the clot syringing should be done keep the ear dry and give analgesics identify the source of bleeding and ear drops my dear friends number 1 if a clot is formed anywhere in the body, the clot is there to blo block the bleeding. It is stopping the bleeding. So, if you disturb the clot, then the bleeding will start again. A new clot will form. So, how many clots are you going to remove? And moreover, the patient is losing a lot of blood also. So, when there is a clot, especially in the canals like canal in the nose or in the ear, we will leave it alone for a few days till you think the healing has happened. Okay. Only thing is you have to keep the ear dry so that infection do not happen. We do not aspirate. Syringing is an absolute contraindication in this case and ear drop is not going to help anyways. Ear drop is going to remain after the clot, till the clot, the trauma is deep to the clot. So, if you even if you put an ear drop, A, it is not going to reach the area where it is required, B, it is going to moisten the canal. So, canal is not going to be dry anymore and there is no need to identify the source of bleeding because the bleeding has already stopped. If there is a clot, uh, there is no frank bleeding, why do you want to identify the source of bleeding? There is, it is not going to serve anything. That's why keep the ear dry. If there is a clot in the nose or the ear, keep that area dry and don't disturb the clot for few days till the healing has happened. After the healing you think has happened, then you can remove the clot and you can do whatever you have to do. it. Even if the tympanic vein is perforated, still you don't disturb the clot. Okay, So, it's a very simple actually question. 
right uh, cricothyroidotomy k plum is a wrong answer immediate management is tracheostomy tracheostomy is the immediate management so, uh, uh, rati is saying that the question was immediate management so immediate management is tracheostomy tracheostomy is the emergency that's why i told you see immediate management in this patient you can do two things tracheostomy cricothyroidotomy cricothyroidotomy is only done when tracheostomy is not possible if tracheostomy is possible 100% tracheostomy is done only if tracheostomy is not possible you will go for cricothyroidotomy so tracheostomy is 100% percent correct answer if it is given in the choices okay that is the correct answer without 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 any doubt no cricothyroidotomy no it is not done you keep in your mind this thing cricothyroidotomy is not done unless you feel the patient is 100% percent dead otherwise you don't do it this not true but this is how you think about it about cricothyroidotomy you don't do it okay now this is adenoid hypertrophy image and which of the following is associated again i'm giving you five uh, choices i don't know which are the four correct choices different people are giving you different choices so i thought jo bhi mila sab dal do at least we can discuss so it's a part of waldeyer's ring cause failure to thrive regress at two years of age hot potato voice rhinolelia aperta i hope the choices were correct we all know that adenoid is a part of waldeyer's ring all the tonsils of the pharynx are parts of the waldeyer's ring adenoid palatine tonsil lingual tonsil tubal tonsil all of them are part of waldeyer's ring so a is true now adenoid will hypertrophy will never cause failure to thrive because the child can always breathe from the mouth eventually they all become mouth breather and there's adenoid phases we know about this isn't it so adenoid hypertrophy is never going to lead to it can stunt the growth it can cause some distress and snoring and all that but failure to thrive is not there the child is not going to die the child never dies because of adenoid have never dies of adenoid hypertrophy and it regresses after 5 6 years starts regressing at least after 8 years but till 5 years it is not going to regress 5 6 years it is not going to regress and hot potato voice is seen when there is a growth in the oral cavity like tonsillitis quincy epiglottitis this causes hot potato voice and this can cause rhinolelia clausa because the nose is blocked nasopharynx is blocked then you get rhinolelia clausa aperta happens when there is a palate problem cleft palate palatoplasty palatal surgery you know palatal uh, palsy these are the any palate problem causes aperta not growths like adenoid or turbinate or polyps or tumors so out of the five choices a is the correct answer adenoid is a part of the waldeyer's without doubt everybody knows this it doesn't cause death it's, it's never going to give because the patient will become mouth breather if the adenoid remains for a long period of time the child starts breathing from out and adenoid remains at least 5 to 8 years the same shape if you don't operate if you operate that's another point it will not regress up at least till 8 to 10 years of age and hot potato voice is oral cavity growths and rhinolelia aperta when there is a palate problems okay rhinolelia clausa was an option if rhinolelia clausa is an option then this also is the correct answer then a will not be the correct choice something the language of the question will be different rhinolelia clausa can happen in adenoid hypertrophy it is true because it is blocking the nasopharynx so that can happen so i'll be saying rhinolelia clausa was then the language in the first one must have been different or maybe the question is which of the following is not true of uh, adenoid hypertrophy and then maybe then you have to give me the correct choices then both are correct answers have capsule and kipta magna second options okay have capsule and kripta magna now capsule and kripta magna are seen in palatine tonsil not in adenoid so in that case you know what in in that case the question must be which of the following is not true of adenoid hypertrophy if they say which of the following is not true then it is a part of the world age that is true uh, rhinolelia clausa can happen that is true and one more choice they must have given uh, regress after 5 years or 7 years something like that and then because have capsule and kripta magna these are seen in palatine tonsil and not in adenoid or maybe they do not have capsule on and kripta magna so uh rhinolelia uh, clausa was given in the choices have capsule and kripta magna was the second choice is a part not a part of the waldeyer's ring he is saying ali saying it was it is not a part of the waldeyer's ring so uh 
that in that case uh, rhinolella clausa becomes the correct let's say the choices are uh, it causes rhinolella clausa it is not part of waldeyer's ring and has a capsule and crypta magna and there is one more choice so straight away that means the question is which of the following is not true of adenoid and a uh, which of the following is true and a becomes the correct answer a is the only true answer because it causes rhinolea clausa but it is it is a part of the waldeyer's so when they say it is not a part of the waldeyer's that is not true and it does not have the crypt, uh, capsule and the crypta magna okay and if you can share the exact image image was different but it doesn't matter you know image does not matter because uh, uh, they have already said it is adenoid hypertrophy so image is immaterial it is image is just to assist or to confuse it is sometimes image is immaterial if in this question no matter what is the image it is useless image they have mentioned it is adenoid hypertrophy it doesn't matter uh, what image they have shown but you get the gist of the whole thing <coughs> delphian nodes are level 3 4 5 6 5 or 6 delphian node you know in the neck nodes are divided into six groups six levels 1 2 3 4 5 6 delphian nodes are six level nodes they are also called pre tracheal or pre laryngeal or pre tracheal nodes they are sometimes called in front of the larynx or trachea they are present and that's why it's a straightforward now these are the six groups of lymph nodes in the neck level 1 is submental and submandibular level 2 is jugular jugular uh, lymph nodes they can be divided into 1 and 2 1 a and 2 a and 2 b group 3 are called along the internal jugular vein group 4 are uh, around the lower part of the internal jugular vein and group 5 is posterior triangular which is missing from here group 5 is posterior triangular and group 6 is the one they are talking about this is called delphian nodes so just a fact that you have to know it's not a ENT question actually it's an anatomy question this is an anatomy question but I just thought that I'll discuss it. Identify the prosthesis, okay? Blomsinger, Gromit, uh, Montgomery tube, tracheoesophageal tube. Now I don't know what was the image. Was the image like this? If this is the image, this is a Montgomery tube, T tube. It's also called Montgomery silicon T tube. Is the full name Montgomery silicon? T because the shape of the tube is like a T, so T tube, and this is a type of tracheostomy tube. It's a special type of tracheostomy. Okay, and if the image was like this, then this is a Blomsinger valve. So depends on the image whether it is this image or this image. Either Blom, this is Blomsinger. The previous one is more grommet. We all know grommets are very simple. They are used in the ear. And tracheoesophageal prosthesis, Blomsinger is a tracheoesophageal prosthesis actually. Okay, so tracheoesophageal prosthesis can be of many types. Blomsinger is only one such types. So <coughs> so which one? First one or second one? Which one? First one or second one, guys? Please let me know. Second one. So second one is Blomsinger. Medical officer saying second one. Straight away it is Blomsinger. Now these are the other prosthesis. See this is Montgomery tube. The second one. This is Probox tube. This is Montgomery. Right. And this is Muir passive valve. And this is Blomsinger. And then there's Groningen button, there's Panja. These are the various types of valves that can be used in various uh, uh, conditions for speech rehabilitation, for breathing and other things. So you can see all the possible valves. Now, whichever image was there, you can pick the correct answer from here. But Medicop is very confident, 100% that it was a Blomsinger valve. So Blomsinger valve is the correct answer in my opinion and interestingly I'll tell you Blomsinger was asked five or six years back also 
So, this question has been repeated. They are repeating this question after 4 or 5 years. And I tell you in the class also that these valves are very important because they have asked Muir passive valve also recently, Blom Singer they are asking second time. So, these valves are very important. That is why I am showing you all the valves. Okay. In PG also, so please keep in mind, in PG also when you appear PG entrance exam, again they will ask you the, the same questions. They can ask you these questions from you. Okay, guys. Next one. <coughs> A 50 year old male presented with right sided serous otitis media. <coughs> with cervical lymphadenopathy, probable cause is juvenile angiofibroma, <coughs> nasopharyngeal carcinoma, adenoid hypertrophy, fourth choice I do not know, <coughs> maybe nasal polyp. <coughs> now, we all know if an adult has right sided adult with unilateral serous otitis media, the most important cause is nasopharyngeal carcinoma so many times, so many times in the class I tell you, straight away. Juvenile angiofibroma, as the name tells you, is seen between 10 to 16 years of age. 10 to 16 we say, but little bit here and there. So, it's not, never seen in 15 years old. It can cause blue ear, but not in 50 years old patient. And it will never cause lymphadenopathy. It does not cause lymphadenopathy, right. Again, adenoid hypertrophy is seen in small children. It can cause blue ear. It is the most common cause of glue ear, but in small children, but again there is no cervical lymphadenopathy. Okay, so nasopharyngeal carcinoma, I think, is a straightforward answer to this question. There should be no problem in anybody's mind. Okay. A 22-year-old male with recurrent bleeding presents with signs shown in the CT smears with Holman Miller sign. They are talking about. In Holman Miller sign, the cause of massive bleed from the nose is due to the following reason. That was the question. So basically, all this question is just a trick. The image is not important. They basically ask you in when do you have Holman Miller sign? You have to know this condition. And this patient has excessive bleeding. Why the bleeding happens is the question. So we all know Holman Miller sign is seen in juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma, GNA as we call it. <coughs> One second, guys. And juvenile angiofibroma or juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma uh, is seen in children. And the main complaint is a male child with excessive nasal bleeding is the complaint. Okay. And every time there is a bleeding, we always describe this condition as severe and recurrent bleeding. So, why should there be severe and recurrent bleeding is the question. Is it due to lack of capsule, lack of contractile component of the vessels of the tumor, outgrowth of the blood vessels? and massive involvement of the blood vessels. So, what is the correct answer? Now, you know a very typical feature is a vascular tumor. Angiofibroma is a vascular tumor. It is made up of vascular tissue and the fibrous tissue. A very special feature of the vascular tissue, the blood vessel of the tumor is normally a blood vessel is three layers. This tumor blood vessel has only two layers. One layer is missing in the blood vessel of the tumor. Which is that layer? The middle layer, outer, inner and middle. Middle layer is absent, which is sometimes called the fibrous layer, sometimes called the muscular layer. Now, what is the function of this fibrous or muscular layer in a normal blood vessel? The fibrous or the muscular layer, they contract, especially when the bleeding starts. So, if there is a trauma to any blood vessel, when the bleeding starts, uh, this middle layer, the fibrous tissue, they will contract and that will stop the bleeding in most cases. And in any blood vessel, when this layer is absent and if the bleeding starts because it cannot contract, the bleeding will continue till a clot is formed and clot takes a long time to form. So, that is a massive bleeding till then. And this is what happens, this is the exact anatomy or histopathology of a blood vessel of the angiofibroma. And that is why lack of contractile tissue, contractile uh, component of the vessels of the tumor is the correct answer in this particular case. Right. So, B is the correct answer in this case. Uh, lack of capsule causes local spread of the tissue, uh, tumor, but it has nothing to, if, in fact, it will, it has nothing to do with bleeding and it does not involve the other blood vessels. It does not spread like that. It is not a mal malignancy. So, it is not going to spread into the blood vessels. There is not outgrowth of the blood vessels. All this is not true in an angiofibroma. Which of the following middle structure is a derivative of neural crest cells? Again, 
the choices may not be correct auditory canal tympanic ring malleus foot plate now i told you that already i told you most of the external ear and the middle ear develop some branchial arches did i tell you in the beginning there was a question based on branchial arches so we discussed that about periauricular sinus so pinna auditory canal tympanic membrane tympanic ring all the three ossicles they all develop from branchial arches they don't develop from the neural crest neural crest gives rise to the development of the inner ear and out of this anything that you think is related to the inner ear that becomes the correct answer and the only th uh, choice out of the choice so the only thing that is related to the inner ear is the foot plate of the stapes because foot plate we all know develops some otic capsule this is another very important mcq otic capsule is a part of the inner ear and foot plate arises from there and inner ear like i said is developing of the neural crest cells and therefore foot plate becomes the correct answer straight away if you know any in that any microbial uh, uh, embryology of the external and the middle ear you will know that everything is from the branchial arches branchial arch pouch cleft and all that not from the neural crest tumor except the foot plate foot plate is like a uh, uh, we are not the same bro you know foot plate tells the middle ear that we are not the same bro i am alag i am from the neural crest but everything about foot plate is different from rest of the ossicles in the mid middle ear okay so that's how you remember foot plate is saying telling the middle ear uh, we are not the same bro okay so uh ali saying that the question was uh mark structure derived from the which pharyngeal pouch and he saying the point was at the malleus he, so they had given an image there was an arrow marked at malleus and they do not mention they said this structure which is marked with an arrow malleus develops of which branchial pouch or branchial arch and malleus develops from first branchial arch first branchial arch gives rise to malleus and incus and second branchial arch gives rise to rest of the stapes suprastructure of the stapes and foot plate like i told you develops from the otic capsule so if like ali is saying the image showed arrow marked at malleus and they are, even if it is not malleus even if it is incus then they both develop from first branchial arch okay so in that case first branchial arch but was the choice branchial arch and all this given so he saying choice was first branchial arch second branchial arch third branchial arch fourth branchial arch so clearly it is first branchial arch okay first branchial arch is a correct answer for malleus okay thank you ali <clears throat> except the skull with lateral view at 37 degree angle is known as so ali first branchial arch you marked correctly that's a correct answer now i don't know what was the exact question <clears throat> what was the ex exact image <clears throat> but it's saying 37 degree so that's a hint if the image was like this this is not 37 degree this is the front view the image from the front view ap view and the angle is 40 to 45 degree angle this is how we do a waters view or a prs view this is how a waters or a prs view is done so if the image was like this it is around 37 is not exact then it's uh, what is view or shulas and if the image was like this side view and then angle around 30 40 then this is shulas view shulas view now one thing it depends on the image whether it is this one or this one and ali is again telling us the angle given was not 37 degree it was 45 degree so if it is 45 degree from the front then straight away it is this one waters view because prs was not in the choices <clears throat> so the answer has to be one of the two waters or sulers because cardwells and towns view both are from the front anteroposterior view and the angle is very little 5 10 degree angle in cardwells and towns view only 5 to 15 degree angle not so much 
Now, now look at these two images. In Schuller's view, it is a sagittal view like I told you, side view, and the head is parallel to the X ray film like it is shown in the second image, and the angle is between 25 to 30 degree angle, <coughs> which can be you can say close to 37 degree, but this is most probably not the correct answer. The image is like this side view, but Waters view is a view which is AV view and normally there is an angle of 45 degree occip occipital mental view, but there is a big but. There is a variation in the waters view where you can do the same thing with the angle of 37 degree also. <clears throat> okay. So, that is why 37 degree is a very specific degree that can be used for waters view only and my sense says that is why they had asked you this question because it is a waters view. So, this is the first image, this image was uh, this image was most uh, image similar to this was there 37 degree instead of 45 degree you can do waters view with 37 degree also and therefore, waters view must be the correct answer. <coughs> okay. uh, even if it is 45 degree it is waters view if it is 37 degree both can uh, fit into waters view. Okay. And the mouth was closed. So, obviously, if the mouth is closed, what is view? Because Pierre is view, the mouth has to be open. So, another very important information at least giving us. So, what is view in my opinion was the correct answer in this. So, that is the end of the question, my dear, this session. So, we have discussed 20, actually 21 questions we have discussed, 20 and 1 was, you know, that uh, plus minus question we have discussed. So, 2021 question of ENT in one paper a lot of questions my dear friends is almost become like a major subject you know. So, but like I said most of the question 18 out of 20 were very simple question from the regular notes every notes any institute you read from anybody they will give you one or two where like cricothyroidotomy lot of you got it wrong because uh, the basic concept is you do not know the basic concept of that which I have explained to you I hope you got it right and this angulation of the x-rays because x-ray of the sinuses are very commonly asked but first time they have mentioned the angle also but the image was important what kind of image they showed if the image you could identify then it becomes very very easy. So, again it was not a very uh, difficult question but thank you guys for watching this I hope this session was useful and I really hope that you guys have done very well and you will pass come out with flying colors so that next year we can meet and prepare for PG entrance exam, NEET PG if you clear this exam. So, really best of luck guys and God bless you. Okay? So, we will end this session here. Thanks for joining. Ciao and take a very good care.